And we are live, back coming to you live today from New York City. Welcome to the Newsbook Pulse. Um, I'm your host, Paul Quigley. Joining me today is the head of the Newsbook Research Center, Benedict Nicholson. Welcome, Ben. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Good to be here again. Um, we really are. This is my first time doing the Pulse from New York. Um, I'm at our offices in Times Square. Ben, you're on the Upper East Side, are you? Yeah, that's where, I, that's where I'm at. Yeah, I don't, didn't want to be causing too much echo by being in the same room. So I thought I would be uh, dialing in virtually in our new hybrid reality. So It's funny how sometimes it's easier to, to, to be in two different places when you're doing something like this. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, we've got, as usual on the Pulse, we're focusing on the cutting edge of data, media and communications. Um, but today we've got something very special. We've got a deep review of 2021. Um, Ben's just authored a really awesome report, which is looking at the news that resonated and cultural moments that resonated in 2021 through the lens of social engagement. And we're going to be delving into that report kind of quarter by quarter, looking at some of the big things that happened. As always, please use our comments to say hi or pose a question. Uh, our show's producer, Danielle, will make sure that any questions um, do get to us. And Danielle's also going to share a link to the report. So if you want to uh, download that directly, there's going to be a link um, for getting that there as well. Now, to, to start things off today, um, let's, uh, let's do a little poll. Mm -hmm. um, and let's ask our audience, how, how good a nose do you have for a viral story? And if we look at 2021, which of these four stories was the, uh, was the most engaged with? Um, Four stories uh, have just popped up there. I hope you're able to see the poll. We've got as a Texas deep feed subsides. Some households now face electricity bills as high as $10,000. Trump acquitted in second impeachment trial. Um, WHO urges fully vaccinated people to continue to wear masks as Delta spreads. And his dad's love brought George <laughs> Jordan Mindel from an orphanage to the Olympics. Um, in fact, three out of these four stories got more than a million engagements each. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, one of them got less than a million. And one of them, I think, I think the winning story is over three million. So uh, please let us know what you think was the most engaged. Which of these stories got more than um, three million engagements this year? I'm going to give us uh, just a couple more seconds for uh, everyone to answer. We've got, we're just tipping over 60% participation here. Okay, um, let's see first what the audience thinks was the most engaged. I'm ending the poll and sharing the results. Mm -hmm. And 65% of people say Trump acquitted was the most shared. Very interesting. Um, very few people thought that the uh, Jordan Wendell story was, was going to be the biggest. WHO at 18% and Texas deep freeze 12%. So, did our audience have the right nose? Did they get it right? Let's have a look. And the answer is yes. Um, it says uh, we've got a very educated and smart audience who know the biggest uh, and most engaged with news stories when they see it. So Trump's acquittal got uh, over 3 million engagements. Um, yeah, so. I, I, and I think just to jump in there, I think that's it's maybe a little surprising how few engagements the uh, the WHO one got. I think that that may be one that surprised people. I saw a lot of people um, pick that as their option as well. So uh, yeah, maybe that's a little surprising, but I don't think it's a huge surprise to anyone who engages with the news as regularly as as our audience does that 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 one would be the one with the most engagements. Um, and that was yeah, that was the most engaged piece about uh, about the Trump uh, impeachment second impeachment trial as well. From Fox News there. Well, if we're jumping right into, let's talk about January 2021. So we're going to go through uh, quarter by quarter. And of course, by January 6th, uh, 2021 is already turning into a huge uh, news year. Can you tell us a little bit about engagement around the, the capital invasion, Ben? Yeah, I will do. So um, I'm going to jump in and out the slides, but it just makes makes sense to keep them up for, for this purposes. So yeah, I think, you know, 2020 was a huge year for both politics and COVID. They were really the two dominant stories. And that continued into 2021, at least for the first quarter. And I think it's important to make that distinction between Q1 of 2021 and the rest of 2021, because it did really start to change after that and it, it calmed down a lot um you know you can see here a, a bunch of articles about january 6th 
and the the capital uh, storming of the capital by pro Trump protesters and and then the subsequent impeachment trial. Those articles got millions and millions of engagements. You can see on the right there the the top story is about impeachment, three million engagements, two point five million over a million for the Washington Times as well. There are just a whole there's a whole bunch of attention around the fallout from January 6th and the, the subsequent impeachment, and then also how the tech platforms reacted to that. So what effect politics had on then tech policy and other things like that. So politics was really, really a dominant theme early in the year, and it kind of looked to be setting a tone, but it, it didn't end up being that way quite so much, which we'll get to later when we talk about it later. But yeah, the uh, the Twitter banning the the president and Facebook subsequently banning them as banning him as well was was really a big early narrative that that got millions and millions of engagements. And and, and this was a news event that kind of uh, you know corporate America also mm-hmm. you know and many brands that would normally probably not speak up spoke up about and 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 yeah also resulting in news engagement and and yeah. interest. No, so I, I think that's a really great point, Paul. The um, a lot of companies pledged to stop donating to the campaigns of politicians that participated in what they saw or defined as uh, fermenting the January sixth events. So, you know, p- places like Blue Cross Blue Shields said that they would completely stop pause political donations entirely. Um, some people, some brands paused it to specific individuals or individuals that they identified as having identified them. Some did it completely. Um, we actually did a blog about that earlier in the year that I'm sure Danielle can, can share in the comments again. Um, but yeah, really brands paid attention and took a stand in a way I think they often haven't before along the lines of kind of party politics. You know, we, take, we see them take stands around specific things, whether that's climate or abortion or, or other things like that. But this was much more a party political stand, which I think we haven't really seen before. Yeah, and, and I think we know as well from speaking, we, we had McDonald's on the pulse earlier this year, our um, uh, member of the global intelligence team, that data was played a helpful role, I think, in brands being able to take a stand and seeing that the, um, the insurrection was... Uh, a values issue, not a political mm-hmm. issue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think, and I, I think that resonated with a lot of, of comms teams on on different brands as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, let's um, let's talk about other news events then in Q one. Then there was mm-hmm. uh, we jump right over to the Texas uh, the Texas storm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, I think you you talked about this on the Pulse before, Paul, with uh, with Michael from Ford. Um, but for, for anyone that that didn't manage to attend that webinar, it is up on the website if you want to look at it in more detail. Um, and I'm, yeah, again, I'm sure Danielle can share the link. But this was um, when the Texas storm hit, the completely unseasonal Texas storm um, that plunged the state into freezing temperatures and power outages water pipes frozen, no clean water, no no heat for the homes. That's a huge, huge news story. You can see it there. It's you know, 53 million engagements about the Texas storm, mm-hmm. almost 100,000 articles published. But then there's also kind of moments of, of hope or innovation or interest. And what we saw there was one of the biggest stories was actually about uh, a man who used his new Ford F-150 to to heat the home and power appliances during the blackout. You can see it's actually a local news story from Detroit Free Press. Um, Obviously, that's where uh, Ford Ford is based out of Detroit. Um, Mm -hmm. So and and then he also, you know, helps his neighbors as well, which is another theme that we saw from the year is kind of overcoming adversity and especially community stuff. So wherever people have gone out and helped their community in any way, that has been a huge story this year. And this, this was probably one of the more notable examples of that yeah and this is like there's a a few interesting elements of the the texas storm like we see uh once again it it becomes a kind of fulcrum um or or a catalyst for for a lot of different narratives right there was people who were kind of mocking texas's independence or Mm -hmm. kind of uh energy setup which some argued had contributed to this there was the whole um climate change elements to it Mm -hmm. and you know, AOC definitely in the top 10 stories, Ted Cruz in the top 10 stories, mm-hmm. just as we saw later in the year with the Met Gala, where again, the political and stories kind of ended up wagging the, the dog of the of the Met Gala quite a bit, you know, with both AOC's dress and then later with the, uh, the kind of vaccine, um, uh, the vaccine stories that happened there as well. So, so, uh, but, but what we see 
here is a phenomenon we saw throughout COVID, which is brands and people who, who step in and who step up and who help their community can get huge engagements. There's a lot of good, goodwill and people who like sharing and passing on those stories. Yeah, and I, I do think it's interesting that this kind of thing often happens when politics fails people. So, you know, when elected representatives aren't there to do what people see as being their job in providing, you know, electricity or, or bolstering against something like a winter storm, then people or brands or whoever it might be have to step in and take over that role from the government. And then that, you know, as you said, it's often a there's often a political slant to it, um, even though the actual political news is less engaged, kind of everything becomes political when when we're all forced to be our, our own actor in that way, I think. Mm -hmm. And this would, one of our first pulses this year, we had um, uh, Tanya Reese of Edelman, who's the author of their, their uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer Report. And we saw a similar pattern there, lack of trust in government institutions, NGOs, charities, and trust in companies and corporations um, uh, being, being higher. And um, you know, there's, perhaps little parallels to your description there as well Ben but um this might be this might turn into something we need to have a whiskey to dig deeper into <laughs> maybe we can, I'm, uh, I'm absolutely open to that Paul I can go grab one <laughs> maybe we should jump ahead to Q2 yeah, shall we probably yeah before we get too deep into it um so yeah I mean you know Q2 I think um to preempt any of your questions it's obvious from the slide here that the uh the Delta variant became the big thing in in Q2 um, and vaccines, kind of co-mingling as, as a narrative. So the Delta variant had been identified in India um, earlier in the year, if not, if not at the end of 2020, actually, uh, but we just didn't have a name for it, which I guess shows the power of names and creating narratives, because mm -hmm. that's when you know, engagement about the Delta variant exploded. Um, and it's because the, the WHO wanted to you know, make things easy to remember. They didn't want to link it to location because there are negative things that occur when that happens, as we've seen with, you know, various various different names for viruses across the years. Um, and yeah, so that, that essentially is when the Delta variant became not only the dominant variant, but a dominant news narrative too, because it was literally a race, especially in America and Europe, it was a, a race against time to get the population vaccinated before this faster spreading variant um, became the dominant variant and overtook the population. And it's interesting the parallels we see now with, with the Omicron variant and people trying to get boosted before the Omicron variant makes too much of a dent in, in people and, and people's everyday way of life as well. It's almost hard to believe there was a time before we talked about variants, but it was <laughs> recent. They, these only appeared on our radar in Q2. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, very interesting to see the engagement, people sharing stories that are about, that are urging, I suppose, changes in behavior um, mm. very much, um, getting back to wearing masks and some of the other public health advice that came with the, uh, with the Delta variant. Yeah, I, I think, and, and you know, that I, that's the important of, you know, we talk about comms a lot and comms strategy a lot on the Pulse. And I think that's the importance of, of maintaining a c consistent comms strategy, particularly if it's several agencies working with each other, because I do think there was some confusion about whether we should be wearing masks, like the WHO is saying one thing, the CDC is saying another thing. You know, some are saying you're fully vaccinated, that's fine, go and do what you want. Some countries are saying, no, you can't do that. So I think that did create a real problem into like people just didn't know what to do because they didn't know which advice to follow and you you look to authority with these things and it just didn't it, it wasn't quite there in the way that it needed to be despite some fairly clear communication on an individual basis I don't think there was really as much tactical cross communication as there maybe needed to be and when you you know earlier in the year we talked about this as well there had been a lot of if not misinformation about vaccines, then maybe fear mongering about vaccines. Um, you know, one of the biggest articles of the year was a Chicago Tribune article. I think maybe the biggest article, news article of the year at least, was a Chicago Tribune piece about um, someone who died after getting a vaccine, even though there was no correlation between the two. The headline kind of implied a correlation and it was shared amongst groups and it was nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And people said, oh, look what the vaccine does to you. You know, when that's getting four million engagements and then these are getting tens of thousands of engagements, that 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 potentially creates a problem if there's not then a unified message. And mm -hmm. I think that's something we kind of hinted at at Q2. And here's another little um, maybe factoid that, that, that people might might like is the WHO seems to have changed your naming convention, as you said, over to Delta. Like we know the WHO are news of users and we know from doing a doing a um, 
webinar with uh, one of our users with Provoke that the WHA used to advise use our, you know, B142, like they did not on anyone to call it the Indian variant or the Spanish variant or the wherever variant or the South African variant. They wanted people that had such clumsy and unsummarizable names that people were ignoring that and saying the Indian variant. And I think this switch over to using the Greek letters seems to have, seems to have dealt with that. Yeah, um, sorry, just a, a question from Mel in the chat there um, that is, is worth going to. We uh, basically asking how long, how long do we measure for the, this time frame on this? Uh, we have a standard measurement of 30 days on these because that's when most news articles honestly get the majority of their engagement within the first 48 hours. Um, and then we keep measuring for 30 days after that at, at various intervals. So should we talk about uh, engagement with um, at a publisher level in 2021, like step out of the, the quarter by quarter uh, cadence for a moment, um, Ben, and, and, and talk about who are the biggest publishers and winners and losers on, on social engagement this year? Yeah, let's do that. Um, so I think, oops, jumping ahead slightly. Um, so the Daily Wire uh, is, is the answer to, to the biggest winner um, of, of 2021. They uh, were top of the rankings. They moved to the top of the rankings in December 2020, and they haven't really looked back since. I think what's interesting in this side by side is just the amount that engagement has fallen off there. So you look in January, there were, and obviously that's a huge, huge month with the impeachment and, and insurrection and the inauguration of Biden as well. Um, but even there, you've got 76 million, 71 million, 59 million. Moved to November, the Daily Wire is top with 39 million, which would have put it eighth in January. So just far, far less engagement across the board from everyone. And everyone else has gone way back to the point that the Daily Wire is almost double its nearest competitor, the Daily Mail. So that's, I, I think, a really interesting dynamic is we've all just kind of gone, no, that's enough. That's enough news. Um, mm. You know, I'm going to pay attention to what I really care about. I'm not getting sucked into politics discourse. I'm not getting sucked into, you know, arguing about vaccines online. I'm just going to look after everyone, I think, needs a break, to be honest, after 2020 from the news. And I think people felt that with, with vaccines and a new president, I think people felt permission to switch off if that makes sense mm -hmm. um, and, and people have done that and it's, it's not to say that there haven't been really big news articles or successful campaigns it's just what it takes to be a big news article or a successful campaign right now is not what it once took so I, I, great news isn't it for communicators like I, I remember like years, some years ago after the 2016 election talking to um uh, uh, the Jim Kennedy, the VP of strategy at the AP, and we we're talking about the mono news story. There was just one news story for a long mm -hmm. time, I felt, and it was what has he done now? Kind of stories about Trump, which were President Trump that were kind of dominating a lot of the news cycle at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of there's been a breath of relief. Well, unfortunately, we we're straight into a pandemic, but there was once a normal ish time, perhaps, when the news. Just seem to be dialed down a few a few notes of urgency and maybe maybe we're going to re-enter that time now and it's a bit yeah I, I think it allows things to breathe a bit more um and and you know this is a question again in the chat about what we think will we'll break through i think you know as we as we talked about earlier any kind of community stuff is always good um sustainability is is a huge huge thing right now i think people are very switched on to, to climate stuff um i think yeah any kind of people also want feel-good stories right now um you know there is a cynical element online but while it's loud i think the cynical element is largely drowned out by you know <laughs> you look on facebook it's a lot of hopeful stuff that gets shared still so i yeah. just, just one note before we move on i think it's it's really interesting in terms of like the level of volume of stories in 2020 just to give an example, CNN uh, had 72 articles that had more than a million engagements. And this year so far, they've had five. So I think for any news users out there, I think that when you're, when you're expectation setting for, for what is a big story, I think that's really important to remember because it's, it's not the same as it was. I'm gonna bet it's much better for engagement to be in opposition as a media outlet. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you see that with the Daily Wire. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Really, you know, that, that's really interesting to see that um, 
a decline in really high politics news engagement and I, uh, that, that does feel like a, that would be a breath of relief well look let's change let's change gears maybe and, and talk a little bit about the the summer this year um and what we saw in in q3 um we we saw what were the conversations around sports events this summer and what were the most engaging themes around the olympics and, yeah. and the news events man. so some huge engagements around sports um obviously as you said uh, the olympics there was the french open and wimbledon as well and euro 2020 which obviously was in 2021 um so setting the tone for that i think was naomi osaka who decided to drop out of the French Open for mental health reasons. Um, having initially decided not to do press conferences, she was then, there was then discussion of punishing her for that. And at which point she said, you know what, I'm not gonna bother. My mental health is more important than a tennis tournament, which I think resonated with a lot of people. I think a lot of people are experiencing burnout in various ways right now, um, having been home for essentially two years or, or working in person in a pandemic for two years, whichever the case may be. So I think that really resonated with a lot of people. And then basically something very similar happened to Simone Biles during the Olympics. And she just couldn't compete. She, she wasn't feeling in a fit state to compete and dropped out. And huge, huge backing from the general public. Some attacks from conservative media accusing her of being weak or, you know, whatever, um, but largely massively backed. Um, and I think it was a summer of athletes kind of puncturing the bubble on, on what their life is like. Um, and that extended into to Euro 2020 where, you know, people like Marcus Rashford and other, um, other athletes of color on the, the new, on the England team at, spoke about racism. Um, and it was, it was the first major platform they'd had to address uh, the, the Black Lives Matter movement and, and to kneel in solidarity with the, the Black Lives Matter movement, which is something we've seen in America for a long time, obviously, but that was replicated mm -hmm. in England, which, and again, really resonated with people, not, not everyone, but pretty much across the board got a lot of support on, on the social web. Um, I, go ahead, sorry, Paul. Mm -hmm. No, but um, there's, there's another interesting story that we've got up on the slide here as well, mm. but, uh, an anti, who's this anti fizzy drink? That yeah. could possibly be you, you may have heard of Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, I, I, yeah, I just I wanted to include this just to talk about. Um, you know, we talk a lot about brand partnerships and and influencer partnerships. What happens when someone unprompted criticizes your product? Um, and this was this was actually a huge one for for uh, Coca Cola, and it was Ronaldo saying basically drink water, um, and moving the Coca Cola bosses out in, from in front of him at the pre press conference, um, which Coca Cola was a sponsor of the tournament. So that again got a, a huge level of engagement, and obviously was not you know that's a, a potential mini crisis uh, for for Coke just because of something an individual athlete with a huge profile chose to say. So you know. The, the power of individual voices amplified by social media these days is, is, is nothing to, uh, nothing to be sniffed at either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's um, well, just another question there that's come in, so, you know, the feel good stories and calibrating them. Uh, just one kind of thing I think we'd see because we're, you know, in the data a lot and tell me if I if you'd put a different event, but you know, the, the big, really big engagement tends to happen on Facebook in terms of volume, and it's much less cynical than you would expect. So, mm -hmm. you know, something that might look cheesy, like, you know, our classic example of Brewdog, um, turning to making a hand sanitizer in the early days of the pandemic, was greeted with some sneering and, oh, another PR stunt mm. from Brewdog among kind of PR insidery people, but then it's getting tens of thousands of positive engagements on, on, on Facebook. So I think mm -hmm. um, you've got to be willing to be a little uh, not cynical sometimes this is, would be our answer to that yeah I, I think facebook is a much less cynical place than twitter as a as a <laughs> broad community i think is a it's probably more of a general populist sample set so as always we're in danger of running out of time unless we jump ahead to q4 i think um, last so one yeah, the great resignation, shall we? Yeah, the great resignation, which has obviously been a thing for the whole year, but I think um, it's kind of Q4 has really spoken to a realignment of sorts of kind of worker power. Um, so looking at Striketober, which was the thing we talked about when I was last on The Pulse, um, and 
you know, workers going on strike in order to fight for better wages, better benefits. Uh, now, a lot of a lot of companies actually preempted this earlier in the year. So that was and, and they saw stuff like this coming and tr moved to prevent it early. So Chipotle raised their minimum wage. Disney changed their um, outfit guidelines or whether you can have tattoos and certain hairstyles. Um, and some companies didn't. So they then it's particularly like factories that that's where the, the strikes have been and uh, around working conditions. Um, so places like, you know, Kellogg's, Nabisco, John Deere, et cetera. Um, those have been some of the really big high profile strikes that have lasted weeks, if not months. I think John Deere was probably the biggest one um, recently. And, you know, the, there's always a lot of solidarity between the public and striking workers. So, you know, you have a chance to, to, to set off a strike. Um, and then but once it's started, there is always an actually incredible amount of solidarity and people don't really care. There's no positive impact on your brand for resolving the strike you'll always yes. be known as the employer that was striked against yeah so what we saw right when you, you analyze this a lot of engagement on the stories reporting the strike reporting the strike kicking off and very little engagement towards the end when it's when it's resolved exactly yeah exactly yeah. so the social amplification really comes when when the picket line is up um so i suppose yep. putting that happening um has got the, the big value um and when, when uh, were there any other patterns, I suppose, that you that you pick out from looking at those strikes? You know, a certain number of days that people tend to engage. Do people kind of uh, did the public lose interest pretty quickly, or did things rumble along? Uh, there's a the, there's normally an initial spike and then an ongoing murmur. So you know, there's there's a high level of interest, and then the influencers are still interested in it, but the general public isn't as interested. I would say unless there's a, a big secondary event. So for example, I think with the John Deere one, there was a big secondary event where um, replacement workers were brought into the factory and uh, then there, there were then a bunch of accidents oh. at the factory, um, which people saw as ironic and shared online. I, th I think a lot of your, your work on like these kind of pattern prices, like strikes or data breaches, things that happen again and again, like for anyone who's one of our uh, is a news user who's, tuned in it's great to use spike to go back and look at previous ones so you kind of know what's in store if, if you know in terms of public engagement and um by looking at previous issues that have happened to other brands that, that that could be mapped onto the current situation you're facing and there's quite interesting patterns that you can discover there that you highlighted in the reports this year but yeah definitely and we'll, we'll have a crisis report we do a quarterly crisis report so our next one will be in january looking at a q4 crisis so if anyone listening has anything they'd like us to do an analysis of please please write to me um i'm always always looking for ideas and, and interesting stuff to write about so happy to do that either in the report or you know we can discuss it privately too if you're interested please do please do reach out we're very interested in yeah covering um the themes and the patterns and this business it's a very fast evolving world in terms of strikes it is or uh, kind of uh, public crisis and issues it's great to see this realignment though in favor of employees i'm definitely uh it's, uh, it's good to see this happen and maybe a yeah. degree of empowerment that's that, that that's happening I'm not about to lose the room, am I? I'm in a week work, by the way. Uh, so, well, look, let's see. We've, we've that, that, maybe that will be the about time anyway. <laughs> How about 2022 predictions before we go, Ben? Could you feel comfortable? As but, yeah, very, very quickly. I, I, I would be very surprised if engagement doesn't go back up in 2022. I think we've all taken a, a collective breather. I think politics is going to come back to the fore, and I think that engagement to web articles, especially you know on Facebook, I think the, the demise of Facebook has long been foretold and is is somewhat exaggerated I mean even Gen Z is is more than 60 70 percent on Facebook so um I, yeah I think engagement will rise again to to make a long story short I think we we won't we won't be taking a breather for too long very good yeah no we've seen the, the uh, like content engagement news engagement it's fallen down to a level but it's stabilized and we're very interested to see what kind of narratives are going to kick off for next year um so uh i, I think we've got, got our audience questions covered i really do think i'm going to be booted out of the room now so it's a very unceremonious ending to my first pulse in new york city <laughs> that's about right I, it's about right for new york hey i'm working here etc yeah 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 hey um, i'm podcasting here <laughs>
<laughs> okay, well, listen, can we please uh, wish all everyone who's tuning in great holidays. Thanks for tuning in to us this year. Uh, we're going to be kicking off again in January. Um, uh, we've got a pulse um, coming up. We're going to be looking at, in fact, the topic of employee engagement um, with James Wright of, of Red Havas. It's going to be awesome. So I will see you there. Let's go 2022. That's it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.